thank you for that introduction, Venat. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and our online guests. Um, <clears throat> it is indeed a privilege to be speaking today. And uh, what I'm going to be talking about is a project uh, that we've embarked on in partnership with the Mercita, but it's uh, very quickly growing into a multi-stakeholder project. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about that, focusing on skills development and the 4IR. <clears throat> so the title of my uh, presentation, I titled it Learning Factory, Where Technology Builds People. And, um, you know, it's one thing to look at how we can adopt technologies um, to improve efficiencies, productivity, etc., in the workplace. Uh, but it's another thing to look at the skills pipeline or the development of that skills pipeline that's required uh, when adopting those technologies. So just to, to give it a bit of context, um, the Mercita, for those of you who don't know, is the Manufacturing, Engineering and Related Services CETA. And um, they've identified that in the next five years or so, one in two Mercita jobs are going to be at risk due to digital interventions. And the main reason for that is that the workforce is not necessarily ready to adopt these new changes that are coming due to uh, digital implementations. So we partnered with them to create what we refer to as a master learning factory at the CSIR. And the intention is then we would create a toolbox of tools that will enable skills development or support skills development particularly uh, focusing on TVET colleges, but not limited to. Uh, there are engagements we have with the special economic zones and projects in there, and the industrial development zones, et cetera, and uh, with other entities as well. <coughs> but the partnership with the Mesita was founded on the intention that we would support skills development at TVET colleges and focusing on uh, for our aspects. The intention then as well is to implement learning factories at or within every province, uh, the target being two per province. But as we are gaining traction on the project, this is changing to looking at how we can implement this type of facility uh, or this type of concept rather to the uh, industrial development zones, etc. So uh, <coughs> I'm sure you guys have all seen this and you all understand what the 4IR is about, etc. Uh, just some interesting uh, points on it from my perspective. The first industrial revolution looked at harnessing heat in the form of steam and then creating mechanical motion. And we had a very distinct intervention of technology that facilitated some <coughs> disruption uh, in the economy. The interesting thing is that when we look at steam locomotives, um, the first steam locomotive was implemented commercially in the 1800s, early 1800, and South Africa only received that technology 60 years later. And if we look at now what we refer to as the fourth industrial revolution, we have to ask ourselves firstly, what is it? There's a lot of definitions that converge onto, you know, the merging of cyber physical systems where atoms meet electrons, etc. But there's no distinct driver of that fourth industrial revolution as uh, was seen in the previous industrial revolutions. For example, if we look at what they consider be to, to be drivers such as artificial intelligence, augmented reality, or uh, data science, etc., those fields have been around or those technologies have been around for quite a long time. If we look at additive manufacturing for decades, artificial intelligence for decades as well. So there's no distinct, in my opinion this is, there's no distinct decoupling point or intervention that's enabling the fourth industrial revolution. And I like to refer to it more as an evolutionary process as opposed to a revolutionary process. And the reason being is that there's a multitude of opportunities that arise when we look at the integration and the application of the technologies, but more importantly, when we look at the availability and the access to those technologies. Um, as I mentioned, with the steam locomotive, there was a 60-year lag. If the new technology is implemented nowadays, we can very readily access that within a relatively short period of time. Um, Prof. Marwala from the UJ refers to it as the democratization of technology. 
And I think that's very, very important in terms of understanding the nature of what we're dealing with. Initially, when we were dealing with the Mesita, we looked at uh, manufacturing applications. And that was founded on what they refer to as Industry 4. Industry 4 and the 4R are technically two different things. We'll be looking at expanding the application of these technologies and the way in which we uh, implement these technologies to a multitude of sectors. We then looked at the, the possibility of expanding our facility to accommodate the application to different sectors. And we found that there's a number of opportunities that could be leveraged. So we evolved it <coughs> to accommodate uh, aspects such as smart mining, smart manufacturing, etc. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the CSIR, we have nine clusters, with each of them focusing on specific needs of uh, different sectors. For example, we have a, a cluster focusing on manufacturing, a cluster on mining, etc. And through this project, we were able to find uh, many different opportunities through engagement with our colleagues in the uh, CSIR, but also with engagements or through engagements with their stakeholders uh, from industry and government entities as well. In terms of what these disruptive technologies are, um, the list is not really exhaustive, but there seems to be a convergence on to uh, technologies like the Internet of Things, additive manufacturing, artificial intelligence, data science, etc. And uh, the characteristics of it is that we enable interconnectivity. Um, and for me, the, 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 the main driver or the, the main difference is that now the ease and the availability of information to gain insight into a system uh, is much easier than it was before. And I always use the case where um, if we look in the mining industry and we take a rock drill operator and that person has been doing the same job for let's say 20 years or so, there's no technology that's necessarily going to supersede his skill in understanding how the system, uh, the system works. That person can hear when a drill bit is going blunt. They can feel when the, the pressure is too low. Now, in that case there, when that person has insight into uh, the working environment, we don't need an intervention of technology. But when we talk about the way in which and the trends in which uh, industry is going with regards to products having shorter life cycles, uh, more rapid introduction of technologies, etc. It's difficult to get that type of insight when the system is continually changing. And specifically, I mean, if we look at manufacturing systems uh, with you know, shorter product life cycles, very frequent changeovers, changes in designs. If we look at vehicles, uh, if you buy a you know, vehicle now in three years' time, it's, it's almost obsolete in terms of its design or the, the shape of it, et cetera. So we see that trend where industry is moving towards what we refer to previously as mass customization. And to adapt to that, then we look at these different technologies and we look to technology to give us insights into the system to better uh, manage the operation of those systems. In terms of mainstream interventions, there's disruptions that arise from digital inf interventions. An example would be smart farming, uh, where we have plot, plant sensors, agricultural robots, smart tractors. <coughs> Some companies have moved on from producing tractor or agricultural equipment to selling data. And uh, you know, the models for actually interpreting the information that comes from these sensors in order to give the farmer insight on as to how to go about better uh, prepping his, his crop or the land for, for higher yield. But again, the, the key here is that we use technology to give the farmer insight and to perform tasks possibly uh, in a more efficient way or in a much quicker way. If we look at mining applications, there's smart mining, uh, there's technology interventions uh, from uh, surveying, autonomous equipment, uh, there's integration of the value chain uh, through internet of things, etc. And I'm sure that you guys would have heard about the hydrogen um, haul truck that was uh, tested as a proof of concept recently. And the company not only looked at developing the vehicle, but also the value chain for supplying the fuel to that vehicle on site. 
So that for me was quite exciting. But what that means is with these interventions, you need a certain skills pipeline development to accommodate those changes. And we can't necessarily expect, uh, you know, different levels of workforce to adapt at the same rate. So that's what we are focusing on uh, with our project. If we look at manufacturing, um, again, the integration of a value chain, giving you insight into the system, allowing you to operate more efficiently, etc. In Italy, there was a use case of where in the textile industry, they were able to predict on which machine an operator would make a mistake on a particular day uh, with the 95% accuracy. The only way they were able to do that was because of obviously the repetitive nature of some of the work done, but using AI they were able to um, improve their, their uh, response to, to breakdowns or to um, you know, certain stoppages that occurred. Now we talk about 4IR and job creation, and everyone thinks that 4IR is going to take jobs. In some cases it will. But I'd like to point out one use case where I just uh, researched this yesterday. Uber, currently in the country, in South Africa, this is specific, where he says, you know, this project is, is uh, very interesting in that you have to look five years ahead of time and you have to take everyone with you. And that's typically what we're trying to do, specifically focusing on TVET sectors, but I'm going to tell you why just now. We then also look at reskilling and then continuous learning as well. And this is, uh, uh, except from the Foresight Africa 2020 report, uh, which states by 2030, we aim to be a nation that has fully harnessed the potential of technological innovation. This is to grow our economy and uplift our people. And there's three focus areas that they look at. One, they want to respond with agility and purpose. Two, we want to take advantages, uh, advantage of the opportunities technological change presents to enhance our global competitiveness. And three, we want to ensure that our citizens are prepared and when necessary to shield them from any adverse consequences of technological change. Now I'm gonna put this into context from a South African perspective. As I mentioned, we have the highest unemployment rate we've had. Much of it is attributed to the fact that we don't have the right skill sets for the jobs that do exist. And if I put it in context with regards to comparing population profiles, on the left you'll see Europe, and you see on the right Africa. What this shows us is that Europe is population top heavy, meaning that there's a deficit in the workforce that's coming in the few years. When we look at Africa, it's bottom heavy. If we think the unemployment rate is, not, is high now, if we don't do something about it, it's gonna be much worse. Now we look at the general classification of our workforce. This is a study done by Masita, and they found that the majority of our workforce fall into a category of what we call elementary occupations, traditionally referred to as low-skilled labor. So now we're talking about implementing technology. We want to improve our systems. We've got a very, very high unemployment rate and we have predominantly what we refer to as low-skilled labor forming the bulk of our workforce. We have a unique challenge in that we need to, instead of using technology to replace jobs, we need to use technology to create jobs. Further exacerbated by this is the fact that we have low literacy levels. South Africa is one of the only countries in the world last year to report a drop in literacy level. So now it's nice to talk about technology and how we want to use technology to improve a system. But we need to do that whilst creating jobs, and we have to do that whilst we have a workforce that is of what we refer to the majority as, as being having a, a low literacy level. This is where we converge onto then looking at how we can implement systems that support low-skilled labor to perform skilled work. Now, while it, while it does seem quite bleak, and we say that you know, the unemployment rate is high and uh, literacy levels are low, everyone still can use a smartphone, irrespective of their literacy levels. 
some of the messages I've seen from my nephews uh, makes me question their literacy level as well. Um, it's Sorry. not a true indication of what I see on their reports. Uh -huh. But I've got a, 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 a three-year-old nephew who actually can go and unlock my phone, go onto YouTube and watch the same video over and over again. Now he's taking advantage of the fact that he can access and implement this technology with a very low level of skill. But it's a very complex process that he's doing. Now in the learning factory that we set up, and I'm gonna describe the, the nature of it, we actually look at focusing on how we can develop technologies such that we give access to the low skill labor system, or la low skill la uh, labor component to perform certain skilled work. It doesn't mean that we are only focusing on low skill labor, but the majority of our workforce, if we talk about technology, we have to take everyone with us. We can't leave people behind. So how do we go about creating those jobs? We look at um, making the accessibility and the usability of these systems um, easy enough to use for, for this workforce component. Then we also looked at focusing on competency development. Um, by the way, just on the previous note, so I have a PhD, but technically I'm unskilled to do a lot of work tasks, and I consider myself in that uh, field as well. And just to put it in further context, when we look at um, the number of patents that are being granted, so in 2020, the World IP Organization reported that 1.6 million patents were granted, not applied for, granted. That means every 20 seconds in the year, there was a patent that was granted on average. There's no university or TVET college that's going to keep up with that rate of introduction of technology. And that's why we find there's a lot of misalignment in terms of the institutes that push out students, in terms of their training and skills development, and then the actual job requirement or the skills that is required uh, uh, on the job. And it brings then to this point here, which is focusing on competency development, where you know, I, I went to a mining uh, company and they said, Charlie, you see all these guys with the PhDs? I said, yeah, I'm one of them. So we don't need them. We need the guys to go in, get the gold, and get out. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Companies are moving away from asking what qualifications you have to asking what can you do. Ernst & Young reported recently that they moved away from their minimum requirements for hiring, being that of a formal qualification. They want to know what competencies you have. And <clears throat> the fact that we would focus on competency development as opposed to a formal qualification, and there's no, uh, and I, I, sorry, I don't want to uh, misrepresent the point. It's not that there's no place for uh, formal qualifications or the niche learning that universities offer, et cetera. I'm saying when we talk about the bulk of the workforce, when we talk about the rate at which technology is being implemented in the workplace, we have to look at the workforce that are typically low skilled. And for them, formal qualification may not be possible. So then what do we do? How do we go about addressing and supporting that integration in terms of the work that needs to be done? And then we look at competencies de competency development. And there's a term that I'm coining which is just-in-time learning. So just as you have with manufacturing, just-in-time manufacturing, lean, etc. I'm trying to create this concept of just-in-time learning, meaning that you learn something only when you need to use it. I went through many university degrees, and a lot of the information I learned, I don't need to use right now. Right? So how can then I equip or create a system that enables somebody to learn something only when they need it? Why would I even think about something like that? Why? Well, <clears throat> I want to create an education system that is agile and flexible based on the needs of the economy. Last year, for example, everyone pivoted to manufacturing PPE and sanitizer. How many people were actually accredited to do so? Did we have any training systems that facilitated that? We had guidelines, yes. But there were no training mechanisms that were agile and flexible enough to adapt to those changes or tell you this is how you can convert this production line into something else. And there was a need for it. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that we learned is that we need to use technology to support training processes. So it's one thing to say we want to train 
in the 4IR. We want to train in artificial intelligence. We want to train in machine learning. But the other side is also a possibility where can we use artificial intelligence to help us with the training? So the example is that um, in one of the uh, projects that we worked on with the Institute of Welding, we created an app. And that app was for inspecting a weld. And that was using 4IR technology to help with the training process and expedite that process. The uh, driver behind that was that uh, you know, a number of colleges can say they qualify you with a red seal in welding. And some of them claim to do that in 20 days. I would not hire someone who's got 20 days of experience in welding for a very high-end job uh, for shutdown in a large enterprise. All right. um, the result was that uh, the president uh, from, from that institute uh, had to go through a vetting process. And out of 2,000 applications, he could only hire two people because the rest weren't deemed competent by him. So what we did was, working with him, we created this application to, and it's, it's still in a very infancy stage. Uh, we're focusing on just one type of world for now, where we put his level of, or standard of assessment of that world into that app. And then somebody has to use that app to do the inspection of, of, the, of the work conducted. So ultimately, the system still produces a student who's a welder. That hasn't changed. But the way in which we do it now, we have this app which has the knowledge of this expert embedded into it. And instead of that expert reaching five to 10 students per day, he can reach now thousands of students per day with that level of standard. So that's an example of how we can use 4IR to help with the training. The other example, uh, probably we'll mention it later, but uh, one of the um, projects that are, or the, the areas that we feel we can really contribute to is what is referred to as the township economy. And this looks at upskilling and reskilling uh, tire fitters, panel beaters, mechanics in the township areas, um, you know, capacitating them possibly with technologies and then uh, supporting them with the skills development to use those technologies and the processes needed to use that uh, in a way that's obviously acceptable. And the exped expediting of the training is done with augmented reality. So we have a use case in our learning factory where we use augmented reality to teach somebody how to replace brake pads on a vehicle. And the reason for that is you don't need to have an instruction set that's written. You just show them a video. And the analogy I always use is, uh, you know, if you get a paper jam in a printer, you don't know how the printer works. But there's a video that shows you open L1, M1, and eventually you get to the paper, you pull it out, and then you close it, and it starts working again. Now, that's a guided process where you had no experience in how to use that piece of equipment. And it's visually driven, so you didn't need to understand high-level languages. You don't have to worry about language barriers, etc. It's showing you, take this, put it there, do this, etc. So that's an example of a, the way in which we can use the 4IR to help expedite that type of training. And we've done that with the brake assembly as a proof of concept. The last thing, and for me the most important thing, is with the learning factory concept, the key to it is collaboration. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. And <coughs> we need to look at what's relevant to industry. In other words, whatever content is placed in a training facility <coughs> must talk to some industry pain point. Uh, again, not, not sort of, uh, it's to ensure that there's alignment with the skills development that's conducted and then the needs of the industry. And I'll talk a bit more about that just now. But this collaboration needs to happen across industry, academia, and government. So moving on, firstly, what is a learning factory? There's an institute or international association for learning factories. Uh, the concept started uh, in the 1990s in America when they looked at fast tracking uh, the integration of students into the workforce. So typically, um, you know, just how, as we have problems now where we say students coming out of a university or TV at college, they aren't ready to work from day one. We need to make them undergo some form of training. They were experiencing this a long time ago as well. And in America, they looked at how they could expedite 
the transition into becoming, uh, you know, value-adding employees. And uh, they look then at replicating a production line. And we have some of this as well, or some of these models running for some of our automotive manufacturers locally as well, where you have a production line that runs separate to uh, the main production line, and that line is used for training. It's for on-the-job training. And typically, when you get a vehicle that requires rework, it's done on that line. So the students that come in that environment get exposure to working on real-world uh, equipment and real-world you know, vehicles. Um, but if they make a mistake, it's not as detrimental to the actual production schedule as it is on the main production line. So it's supposed to be a replica of the real-world environment. And that's why it's termed learning factory, because it's a factory still, but you're learning in it. And if you make a mistake, it's not as detrimental as in the main value chain that you have. In 2016, and well, 2010, let's go back a bit, when uh, you know, the concept of Industry 4 was formalized, we looked at the integration of value chains. One of the working groups focused on skills development for that. And then the concept uh, was then uh, developed further in Germany. Um, to push forward, you know, what they call a learning factory. And this is the model that they use where you have it. It's basically an industry-driven entity or facility. It can be used for education and training, innovation transfer, consulting, and then business creation. So in other words, this entity must support skills development. It must also support innovation to support the local industries around it. And the example of uh, you know, innovation transfer and consulting, et cetera, is where we can look at de-risking technologies. So one of the universities uh, that I've visited in Germany uh, has a replica of the Porsche production line. And you, you know, sometimes if there needs to be a change in the line, there can be a simulated change in that environment and then enable the transition to the main line. So it also serves as what we refer to as an industry test bed. So that's the, the nature of this learning factory. We have research, we have internal sources, uh, external triggers in terms of what's happening in the environment or the ecosystem it functions in. We then enable uh, skills development and innovation, looking at these different aspects here. But however, there needs to be a very strong link and understanding of what industry needs. Now I'm gonna talk about some of the challenges that we find working with the TVET colleges uh, that we've worked with. Um, some of the biggest issues that they experienced were staff capacitation. They also experienced a very big challenge with their procurement systems. But for me, what struck me as quite uh, interesting was that for when looking at occupational trades, uh, if we look at electricians, there's one trade test for an electrician irrespective of whether they're going to work in the domestic environment or an industrial environment. There's one trade test for that. Furthermore, some of the uh, equipment that's being tested on is antiquated, and you won't find that in industry anymore. Mm -hmm. So then not only are we saying that there's a misalignment between what the TVET is pushing out and what the industry needs, we're seeing that there's a misalignment between the assessment mechanism to assess whether or not this person is competent and what industry needs. So we see the learning factory concept as adding value to that type of uh, misalignment. Now, I want to, to you know, explicitly state the concept of this learning factory, this type of uh, facility, is not aimed at competing with the university or TVET college. It's merely there to supplement any gaps that exist. If everything works perfectly, there's no need for any intervention. Furthermore, when we look at the customizability in terms of looking at the external triggers and, and the ecosystem in which this functions, the learning factory that will be placed in the Eastern Cape will focus primarily on automotive applications. But the learning factory in the Northwest can't do that. It needs to look at maybe mining applications. And that's why we refer to our learning factory at the CSR as a master learning factory to be able to supply with what we refer to as these learning building blocks to assemble these customized learning factories around the country. And the reason we say that they, uh, you know, be able to do that is, as Whilst we do have automotive and mining, 
there are certain common building blocks such as artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is artificial intelligence irrespective of whether you apply it to agriculture or mining, etc. There's certain core principles or certain core technologies that you would draw on and you can teach competencies in. So now we come to what we refer to as our learning factory. Um, the outcome of this project was to provide an environment which facilitates skills development and innovation. And remember innovation talking to the support of industry, etc. Uh, applied to the research, design, implementation and operation of 4IR technologies. So it's one thing to say that, you know, we have 4IR technologies and, um, you know, this doesn't really affect me, etc. Uh, but everyone uses Google Maps. Everyone has sort of suggestions from YouTube, etc. And there's 4IR technologies that are embedded in those, those systems that we use. And that's why I, say, I look at the word specifically operation of these technologies. I'm not looking specifically at skill sets required. I'm looking at how you would go about interacting with these technologies. So we provide this facility that can provide skills development to operate technology. Maybe implement that technology and then further on look at designing and researching with that. So we're looking at multiple skill levels when we are uh, considering the design of this facility. So it must serve as a demonstrator for 4IR technologies. Firstly, what is the 4IR and what are the technologies associated with it? And that's based on creating an awareness of the 4IR from a South African context. Then we look at building and leveraging human capital, where we look at uh, enabling workforce readiness. And uh, as I mentioned before, we can train on 4IR technologies, but we can also use 4IR technologies to help us with the training. Um, and lastly, we look at leveraging opportunities based on the tools that we see in the 4IR. And uh, as I mentioned, in the CSIR, we have these different clusters. Uh, I believe we're the perfectly suited institute to foster this collaborative approach, uh, obviously engaging with multiple stakeholders that we serve. And this is to look at what opportunities exist from a South African perspective. Uh, <clears throat> when looking at the nature of the learning factory, the concept is to learn by doing. That's the best way. And, and uh, this model shows that you know when you sit in a lecture, or in a presentation for that matter, um, you retain very little information that was imparted at that point. But when you physically do something, and most importantly, when you have to teach it to someone else, that's when you retain that information most effectively. So the context of this learning factory is that we have, let's say, a modern and evolving work requirement uh, due to digital interventions. We have an existing and upcoming workforce. And uh, if there's a perfect match for that, there's no need for any interventions. But when we're looking at different industries, and let's look at, for example, the mining industry, when we have digital interventions, and as I mentioned, uh, rockdrill operators. In the platinum industry, the rockdrill operator age, on average, is over 50 years. So when we're creating changes in this environment, it's, it's very uh, difficult to expect that the transition would happen very smoothly to adopt these new technologies. So in the event that uh, you know, there's a, a mismatch, then we have these facilities that can create these, these uh, competencies and the qualifications or the skills that are required. And there's entities that exist, such as the universities, TVETs, higher education institutes, et cetera. Industry themselves have their own training institutes. Uh, and then there's private FETs. So how I envisage the learning factory fitting into the system is that the learning factory uh, can be or serve as a, a platform to support entry into these um, uh, institutes for uh, possible further skills development, or it can serve as a uh, rudimentary uh, entry level skills development tool just to give you a basic introduction of what the change in technology is, uh, and then integrate you into the work environment uh, at, at a certain level. And then they can go and get upskilled into that environment. Or the students coming from the universities or industry can get upskilled, reskilled through the short courses that are run in the learning factories and then continue to work in the modern environment. So again, the, the point of this slide is to show that we're not working in competition with the universities, etc. They are there to perform a certain uh, task uh, for a certain 
a demographic and they have certain entry requirements, etc. What we're saying is that when technology happens, it's, or when we implement it, everyone gets affected by it. So the, the students or the workforce that don't get access to these universities, how do we accommodate uh, you know, their transition as well? In terms of how we structured the training or packaged the training that we would offer in the learning factory, uh, we've identified these technologies as I presented before, additive manufacturing, big data, etc. These are done in a modular way. And the reason we do it in a modular way is we want to enable what we refer to as a customized learning path. So somebody coming through the system and only wants to gain competency in additive manufacturing can do so. They don't need to necessarily learn about IoT. They just learn about what they need to. And it also talks to facilitating the just-in-time learning. We package it into four um, pillars, uh, the first one being theoretical training. And this is based on an introduction to the 4IR in South Africa. We have created an online course. And as a measure to get feedback on that course, we opened it up for free registration in December last year. And within two weeks, we had over 630 registrations. So it showed us that there was appetite for this type of introductory level course to what the 4IR is, but from a South African perspective. We have um, practical training stations, and this is to get people to, or the, the candidates to physically interact with these technologies. So if we talk about augmented reality, what is augmented reality? Where is it used? How is it used? Who uses it, etc.? But you physically go and interact with the technology to some extent. Um, whilst I am talking about competency development, there is also intention at some point to look at accredited courses uh, through the QCTO, etc., for uh, these types of offerings. Currently, we haven't uh, uh, looked at that as yet. Uh, the practical application areas uh, look at the practical application of 4IR technologies, and uh, these are industry focused. And um, <clears throat> what we try to do uh, again is that we try to simulate what somebody would find in the environment that they would go and work in. And I'll show you an example just now of a production line that we've created in partnership with a local company. And, uh, you know, it serves as a training facility. Uh, or it's, it's, it serves as a very good uh, application area. The last portion of, of this is what we refer to as experiential learning. And uh, this was conceptualized to address the challenge, you know, where students can't get a job without experience and they can't get experience without a job. And how can we look at then creating a network where local SMMEs can participate, etc., and they have a need for digital transformation or they can benefit from this, but they don't have necessarily the capacity to do so. Uh, they may not have the capex to do so or the human resources to support that, that study, the first initial feasibility study. And the students coming out of the system here can go and support them and get that work experience to some extent. Ultimately, what's driving this whole process is that you must facilitate continuous improvement to some extent. There's no point in a digital intervention if it's not going to benefit or improve the business in some way. But the, the student or candidate going through the system must be able to go into an environment assess the environment from a 4IR perspective, go and identify opportunities of where possible improvements can be made, come up with a solution for that, and then possibly implement that solution. We are not aiming right now to create experts in this field. Right now, we are focusing on creating a basic competency so that everyone has an understanding of what these technologies are and everyone is on the same playing field. And in doing so, we support skills development in terms of upskilling, reskilling, and uh, cross-skilling. I mentioned that, uh, you know, if we look at the mining industry, uh, where there's interventions that will cause displacement of jobs, can we actually look at upskilling them to, to function in the same environment? And where there's not enough jobs available for that, can we look at cross-skilling these workforce to work in maybe agriculture or manufacturing? So in other words, while there will be some displacement, the job is not lost, or the person doesn't lose their income. We also look at then with the skills that are developed, supporting industry uh, through de-risking of technologies, as I mentioned, serving as a test bed. There's consulting services that can be offered, product development and localization. And uh, one interesting thing with our virtual reality simulation 
uh, it's going to add value to the development of a skills pipeline. We've embarked on a journey with some clients, but our engagements with different stakeholders uh, alerted us to the fact that a lot of them have plans to set up a facility to produce different things in six months' time, in eight months' time. They have plans to set up this factory. What they don't have plans to do is create the skills pipeline to work in that factory. And we see this as an opportunity to use the learning factory to, in parallel, whilst the factory is physically being built, we can use virtual reality and augmented reality to train the people on the equipment that will be in that factory and get them to have the muscle memory to work on those equipment uh, as operators or maintenance guys, etc. And when the factory actually opens its doors, you have a workforce that's ready to go and hit the ground running from day one. In other words, the ramp up period is going to be reduced. So even I'm not sure even how much time I have left, so we're good. Okay. Okay, and then also we serve as a, a research platform for processes, best practices. Also looking, as we mentioned, five years ahead of time, where can we look at, uh, y you know, um, where's the need in industry in five years' time, but also looking at cross-transfer of, of technologies. So if we look at the automotive industry, the adoption of 4 art technologies has been very rapid. But if we look in agriculture and mining, it hasn't been as rapid. Furthermore, in different provinces, it hasn't been, you know, uh, being conducted at the same rate. So we can look at uh, uh, supporting uh, the type of implementations that are needed, uh, as needed, uh, based on, on, on the current situations of whoever we, we deal with. So this is now how we go about setting a learning factory. Remember, it's a skills development platform and an innovation platform. It's going to facilitate or enable skills development and innovation for the 4IR. The first step we look at, sorry, the first point or first step in the process is that we need to understand the stakeholders. As I mentioned, the learning factory in the Eastern Cape is going to look different to the learning factory in the Northwest because they serve different stakeholders. So we need to firstly understand what are the needs in terms of the workforce? More importantly, what is already being done? So if we look at uh, the Limpopo province, where we are currently setting up a learning factory as well, uh, there's the University of Venda, University of Limpopo. There's other industry training facilities. There's no need to go and duplicate equipment. So what I'm trying to present here is that we don't have to be a centralized facility. It can be decentralized. So all those legs that I spoke about earlier in terms of the uh, practical training, application cells, experience centers, it doesn't need to all happen on one site. It could happen in that ecosystem. And that's why I say the, the founding principles of this, this concept is the fact that we collaborate. Uh, furthermore, if we have the University of Johannesburg who are foremost experts in, in artificial intelligence, I'm not going to stand here and profess that I'm going to be an expert in artificial intelligence. I'll bring their work on board. There's other CETAs that have accredited courses. For example, the MICT CETA has courses accredited for 4IR in robotics and other topics like that. So then there's no need to replicate that. We can bring that on board. So the, the, the nature, as I mentioned, is that we are trying to facilitate this collaboration and use the learning factory as a vehicle to enable that. But the first step is always understanding the stakeholder landscape. Then we look at the requirements, what's being done, who's doing it, etc., and are there any gaps? If there are gaps, how can we go about closing those gaps? We then come up with the digital roadmap. We implement it and then we monitor and evaluate it from a project perspective. But this is an iterative process because the needs that an entity would have now may change three years from now. So we need to continually undergo this process to ensure that the, the content in the learning factory, uh, once implemented, is relevant to, to the stakeholders. These are some of the attributes uh, that we you know, try to incorporate into the design of the learning factory in that we have modules. We look at it from a modular fashion. We want it to be modular. We want it to be highly configurable. We want it to be up upgradable, et cetera. And the reason for this is we want it to be very flexible and agile. Remember, when there's a change in the need for skills, we must be able to respond in a very short time. Uh, and, and the hydrogen-powered um, haul trucks are an example of that. You know, who's going to create that workforce? Is it solely the developers of that technology? 
but if we have a system like this, we can support that type of um, uh, progress. Uh, it must be most important for me, integrable and industry interfacing, meaning that there must be an understanding of what the need is in the industry. So it's one thing to say I went on a PLC course, now I can program a PLC. But there's certain nuances that we need to bring in as well into the training and this, you know, we look at the soft skills as well in, in the process uh, in terms of problem identification, problem solving, etc. cetera, uh, that we need to look at as well. But all of this talks to, again, the just-in-time learning to create customizable, agile, and flexible training uh, as needed. In terms of how this can fit in with the different environment or the different uh, stakeholders, we've got industry and government needs, national provincial initiatives. I'm going to touch on them a little bit later on. Uh, but we've got different funders. And right now what we see is that throughout the country, there's so many fantastic initiatives being funded, but they're not talking to each other. So we want to use this learning factory concept as a vehicle to facilitate that collaboration where possible through certain projects or uh, content, etc. Uh, again, ultimately, the offering is that we have skills development, we serve as uh, innovation in terms of industry support, localization of technologies, um, and, and I'm, I'm not going to delve too much into that, but if anyone wants to find out, we do have a number of use cases we can talk about uh, on this that we've already done through our master learning factory. In terms of the competencies and the evolution of it, we, uh, as I mentioned, we want to operate the equipment, you want to implement it, research and design with it. So if I'm looking at the low-skill labor component of the workforce, typically we would have operators um, operating that piece of equipment. Uh, higher skill sets, we look at maybe maintaining and implementing that equipment. Uh, and then we look at uh, researching on, on new applications of the equipment and possibly new designs. So. I'm not looking at it in terms of a job profile here. I'm looking at it from a perspective as how we would interact with this technology. Because technically, again, if I have a PhD and I only need to operate the piece of equipment, I'm going to fall under this category here. There's also the business side of things that we need to look at. So before you invest in any technology, you need to understand you know, whether or not it's feasible, uh, the repercussions of that type of implementation, et cetera. Um, but one of the, the demonstrators that we have in our learning factory is a smart home. And that home is connected. Um, I can control it from my phone. I can voice control it. Every single piece of equipment there was purchased from Builder's Warehouse. And the reason that we did it that way was to show everyone that the 4IR is not something in the future. It's here already. Digital interventions are already here. We have to adapt to it somehow. And uh, as the gentleman put it to me two weeks ago, we have to take everyone with us. How do we go about doing that? Um, <clears throat> so in terms of our links with other institutes, I'm going to just have another slide on that just now. We also have the, the World Economic Forum Center for 4IR housed at the CSIR. And uh, that focuses on FOIR policy, the frameworks, uh, processes, etc. And uh, there will be a direct link between the learning factory and that center for FOIR. So we would look at primarily the skills development side of things, the technologies possibly uh, that are relevant, and we would be supported and support the activities of the center for FOIR um, at the CSIR. And then looking at the innovation side of the learning factory, we look at supporting innovation in terms of the supply side of things as well as the demand. And when I say supply, I'm talking about the skills that we would develop and the demand, making sure that the environment that's going to absorb these skills is ready to absorb them in a, an appropriate manner. In terms of the supply, we look at training in 4IR. We use the 4IR for training. We can use the 4IR to integrate the skills pipeline development with the industry needs, meaning that we make sure that we're relevant. And the one that I didn't mention was before was that we can use the 4IR to match competencies developed with industry opportunities. So we can take advantage of the 4IR to actually link a skill set or to expedite linking a skill set to a job requirement. And uh, the ultimate uh, sort of vision that I would have is that we could create this, this platform which is almost like an Uber for, for the workforce. 
Now, again, I talk a lot about mining, um, bias towards that, but if you go to a lot of the mines, you see that there's a number of workforce sitting outside the mine waiting for work on the day, right? Now, if we look at one of the companies in their gold operations, just one site, they reported in 2018 a loss of 2.3 billion rand because of absenteeism. So which means that they lost blasts because people weren't there, and yet you have people outside waiting mm -hmm. to come in. Can we use the 4IR to mitigate against something like that? And the answer is it's possible. There's a number of initiatives uh, that are looking at this type of thing where uh, at the TVET college, you can create a competency or you have a skill set and you get what we refer to as a digital badge. So it's not really a certificate, it's a digital certificate. And we can align that and use the 4IR to link that to the different stakeholders uh, in the area. So specifically in the Eastern Cape, I mentioned the automotive industry. If somebody gets a skill set in programming a robot, they then become competent to go and program a robot in industry. Obviously, there would need to be some mentoring just to ensure the transition, but the time taken is much less than it was before. But we, instead of just using the 4IR to create that competency, we can also use the 4IR to link that competency to the need in industry. So it's not where somebody goes and they look on LinkedIn or PNET or Careers24, whatever it is. Uh, here, there's an actual network that exists that matches a skill set to the need in industry almost immediately. Yes. Thank you for that, Bernard. Okay, and then looking at the innovation side in terms of supporting the demand, that's the, the, the SMMEs, the entities that are going to absorb these students. Um, you know, we have four art assessments where we are able to, or we certified to go and conduct an assessment on a company to understand how ready they are to adopt FOIR. Um, there's, uh, you know, we can gain insight into operations based on certain interventions we've done. Uh, there's optimization of operations and then digital interventions for improvement of operations and processes. So these are offerings from the learning factory side where you can, it's not only looking at skills development, but looking at innovation and how you can create an environment to support uh, uh, the absorption of, of skills. So, uh, just coming towards the end now, um, <clears throat> what will an implemented learning factory do? Well, it's going to be a customized platform. Why customized? Because the most important word for me is relevant. We need to make sure that the content in the learning factory and the competencies taught are relevant to improving absorption. I spoke to a TVET college campus manager yesterday. And um, I was quite shocked to learn that their current absorption rate of students into the workplace is sitting at about 15%. One five. Now what that means, and typically like with my background, et cetera, when, I went, when you go to a university, it's not just your parents funding you, it's almost like a family funding you. So a community gets behind the student to go to the TVET college, pays the fees, the student gets a qualification and then they can't get a job. They have to go and work at a spa, pick and pay. And that's only because there's a misalignment between the competencies taught and what industry needs right now. So that's where we feel the learning factory approach can have very big impact in supporting these types of uh, challenges or addressing these types of challenges at the, the TVETs. So it will be a customized platform for skills development, uh, research development and innovation, and then also, as I mentioned, creating this network. For me, that's the most important side of things, where we can leverage opportunities from existing initiatives. Uh, the work in progress, we have, uh, as I mentioned, a 4IR introductory course, and that's online. There's 11 practical stations that we developed where you can gain 
uh, or you physically interact with these technologies. We have two expedient centers that's in the CSIR. One of them focuses on casting uh, and simulation in casting. Uh, and that's also to, to support the initiatives of the National Foundry Technology Network. It's a pilot program that we, we're starting to run. Um, we want to also look at applying that also to the energy side of things. Um, then we have a learning factory, oh, sorry, we have a pilot learning factory that we're setting up as in the TVET College uh, that's supported by Mesita in the Eastern Cape. There's a learning factory that's supported by what we refer to as the impact catalyst, where they collect or uh, basically gather a pool, a lot of resources from different mining companies, and they look at supporting the needs of the, the local environment. And we're setting up a le learning factory in Limpopo for that. Uh, and then also be very aggressively pursuing the engagements on the township economies, specifically looking at uh, automotive applications and also, you know, when your, your phone gets, uh, your screen gets cracked, where do you normally go? Y you know, those guys aren't typically certified to do that work. Mm -hmm. And uh, how can we use digital interventions to help creating these competencies and these certifications such that wherever you are, you know that you're going to somebody competent. Mm -hmm. So in terms of what we've done thus far, just to show you a little bit of it, we have competencies in simulation. This is an example of a simulation of a plant. And what we do is we create a data set. Uh, we use data that exists from existing uh, sources where possible. Where we don't have the data, we can run what-if scenarios. And we applied this um, in a real-world application to trackless mobile machinery uh, for the mining environment. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, there's uh, something called collision avoidance systems. And it's a, a safety mechanism to prevent accidents from occurring or incidents. And the incidents are classified into machine-machine interaction and machine-human interaction. And uh, typically what's supposed to happen is that when the machine comes into contact or proximity of a human, it's supposed to shut down completely. But what happens now when the mining company wants to change its productivity or change the incline, to give you an idea, one of the, the mines in Sichen uh, the iron mine uh, can use up to sometimes 4 million rand of diesel per day. So the design of the roads impact their overall productivity in terms of their, sorry, their cost um, as, as well. So understanding now changes to the design uh, in terms of incidents that could occur. So where I'm going with this is that we have a road, we can change the inclination of the road, we can change the length of the road, we can change the shape of the road. If we do that and if we change the number of vehicles that are accessing the ore that needs to be removed from the pit, um, if we change those vehicles, we don't know necessarily where the risks could be. So what we've done is we've used simulation to, um, or modeling and simulation to understand where are those potential risk areas. And based on those potential risk areas, we can apply certain mitigating factors uh, customized to those unique uh, scenarios. But what it does is it gives us a, a potential answer before we invest in any changes. And that's the, the beauty of simulation. There was a case once where we had a manufacturing simulation and there was a drilled rod recycler and they employed one person and all they had to do was just cut off the end of these mining drilled rods and then they employed two people expecting productivity would double, but it didn't. And the reason being is that the guys were talking to each other. So we couldn't really <laughs> simulate that. Um, but I mean, it's, it's sort of learnings like that that we bring in, and it, it, it's sort of a progressive um, approach that we take to this. So the data set, set is always an evolving uh, set to help us see into the future in some way. So <clears throat> we also teach what we refer to as human-centered automation. So as I mentioned, we partnered with a company uh, in the Eastern Cape who supply manufacturing lines to OEMs. And uh, they had a unique challenge in that they had to use a South African workforce to assemble machines that a European workforce was going to use. And then there were language barriers, there were skills differences, etc., and they converged onto a very visually <coughs> driven instruction set. So as I mentioned, instead of reading 
uh, you know, how to go about assembling something, there was a picture showing you take this from this light and uh, there's a picture light system there which lights up. Now the challenge is uh, that, and, and the sort of pushback that we'll get is that yes, we're creating intelligence in these machines, but we're taking away the intellect from the people. And that's something that we need to look at. Now, uh, when we look at the nature of this type of work, the fact that we're looking at frequent changes in the design of the system, that person has to continually be able to adapt to those changes as well. For example, the, the line that I'll show you just now, uh, which was started off as this, uh, was used for assembling differentials, and then in one shift. In the next shift, it would be used for assembling turbo assemblies, and then the next shift are different components. So you can use the same workforce on the same production line to assemble different components. And that talks to the reconfigurability side of things. Uh, it's just looking at minimizing your capex and making them more agile and responsive. But the workforce that functions in that environment needs to be able to uh, adapt to that. So when it comes to that intellect side of things, uh, I don't see that as a challenge in this context because there's going to be a change of parts so frequently. They have to adapt. They have to use the intellect to understand what a problem is. Um, you know, a beer company that I, I uh, worked with previously, we used to make beer quarts. And uh, believe it or not, they push out like a thousand of those per minute. It gives you an indication of how much we drink. But it's, it's literally 20 beer quarts per second that they bottle and send out. And that nature, the nature of that type of work, it's repetitive, it's very hi highly automated, etc. Yes, in that type of environment, there's not that much intellect that's needed. But what I'm looking at now in the, the type of uh, environment that we are looking to support with the learning factory, specifically on the SMME side, the people who actually need assistance in understanding uh, whether or not this could have impact, or maybe they don't have the capex and we can link them to, to the network, etc. cetera. Um, that type of workforce, uh, sorry, that type of work environment would be suited to this type of training. We have robotics training. Um, this is a smart home that I mentioned. Again, everything can be controlled from my phone. Uh, in fact, one of the pracs that were run through the NCPC as well uh, on fan and pump optimization, uh, we've instrumented as well. And the tools that we use to instrument these different environments, we teach in those practicals that I spoke about before. So we teach them firstly from a theoretical point of view, they get some practical experience and then they go and apply it to some real world simulation. We also use virtual and augmented reality. Uh, we have collaborative robots. So when looking at robots, if anybody has ever programmed a robot, you would understand how challenging it is and the maths that you need behind it to understand how to go about optimizing the process, etc. These collaborative robots have been designed. We purchased them. They're commercial, uh, commercially available. Um, <clears throat> we purchased them, um, and we learned that anybody who's never done a pick-and-place operation, I can teach them to use this to do a pick-and-place operation in less than 15 minutes, irrespective of their skill level. So I, I would actually make that claim quite, uh, quite boldly. You know, I can teach anyone to use this machine to do a pick-and-place operation in under 15 minutes. And that's just the indicator of how the access and the, the um, ease of use of these systems has, has evolved. Again, talking to low-skilled labor doing skilled work. Where we come in is that we de-risk this technology because not everyone or every company has the finances or capex to go and invest in this to play around to see if it's going to have an impact. But we have the responsibility then to say, okay, this is the, the companies that could benefit from this type of intervention. And, uh, you know, we could do some case studies with them. We can do uh, trial runs with them, as I mentioned, with the industry test bed, et cetera. This is a production line that I was talking about, <clears throat> which is the evolution of this uh, human-centered automation. So we, we, with the company, uh, developed this line here. And the beauty is that that company has a footprint on every continent uh, supplying major OEMs in the automotive industry. And whatever you see here is found in those lines internationally as well. So you can take a student or candidate from this line, get them pro to produce something here, 
and then you, you take them out and put them in the real world production plant and they'll be able to find their way. Before they get to this, there's also a component of virtual reality training, uh, as I mentioned, to, to expedite the readiness in terms of your muscle memory, etc. before the machine arrives. Uh, there's, there's tools for that as well. Okay, lastly, in terms of uh, links to other initiatives, as I mentioned, there's so many fantastic initiatives and we need to make sure everyone talks with each other. And there's four IR centers that are sponsored uh, by the government. There's entrepreneurship hubs, there's technology stations, living labs, innovation hubs, etc. What we see the learning factory in terms of uh, as a first stage of fostering that type of, of uh, collaboration is that we would create the very basic introductory training on what the 4IR is. So if we have a technology station, uh, I believe there's 12 of them, I could be mistaken, but there's general training that can be conducted before they go to this, this entity here, which actually physically makes components for the stakeholders that it supports. So before they get to this point, and training is done here, by the way, as well, but we would provide what we refer to as a very generic training at a very introductory level um, to support these different initiatives. And I mentioned, for example, that we have different legs of the education side of things, being the experience centers, etc. Access to these, uh, these already exist. So again, there's no need to go in and reinvent the wheel. We want to take advantage of what they've already done. It's just in some cases, um, some of them were not successful and are not successfully operated. So there could be an intervention where we could uh, look at uh, you know, supporting it from a learning factory side. But this is just to show that we are not intending to work in isolation. This is a very collaborative approach that we are taking. And where we are not experts, we, we're not scared to put up our hands and say, OK, let's call in the experts who, who are relevant in this field. But it seems that for the country in general, there's a very big need to uplift or upskill everyone to understand what uh, the 4IR is and what the technologies are and how to go about adopting that in your uh, future workplace. So that's the last slide. Uh, I'll leave it at that. And if there's any questions, I can address them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shanil. Um, you can keep the mic for now, I expect. <laughs> quite a lot of questions. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Let's start here. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much for that super interesting and informative uh, presentation looking into the future. Um, you mentioned once township, township economy, and you said you going to have a very aggressive approach and I try to picture you know when you showed at the end how does a, a learning factory look like uh, uh, it's a production line or it's a specific machine that they get trained on and I thought that linkage from these centers to the township and or to township hubs uh, that that we know of um, what kinds of skill sets you would offer in townships. What I mean, you you mentioned that video, how to change brake pads uh, that they can then watch. But I don't know if that is really going to work. But so so, what are really the technologies, the skill set you would see typically in a township setting, utilizing the methodology of learning factories? Yes, thanks. Uh, so so on that township economy. Uh, it was not based on, on our research solely, it was based on interaction with our stakeholders. One of them being the AIDC, or Automotive uh, Industry Development Cluster. And they actually identified the need for upskilling uh, the workforce in townships on automotive applications. Specifically looking at mechanical operations and uh, panel beating operations. Now, what they were looking at specifically was not only the skill sets, but capacitating uh, these hubs with equipment. So townships, specifically the, 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 the guys working in the environment, don't have the capex to invest in state-of-the-art equipment. They're not going to do state-of-the-art color matching, for example. 
but not everyone without insurance can go and afford you know to 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 get it done at an expert level let's say so the intention there was to look at how um, they can support because the work is still being done uh, irrespective of, of whether or not that intervention was there people in the township still go to what we refer to as a backyard mechanic to to uh, service their vehicle for example somebody who's not accredited and what we're saying is can we actually implement using 4IR and this network to standardize the competency of the person performing that work such that somebody working in the township or going to a township uh, company uh, is assured that this person is accredited in some way. Now, in addition to that, uh, there's another company that we spoke to who are looking at creating competencies for tire fitters. Uh, I found that a bit challenging because if you have a tire fitter, it means they need to necessarily have stock of tires, perhaps. And uh, would they have the capacity to do that? And the response by the company was, well, there's government entities that actually support that type of um, intervention. Because for me, the sustainability side of things was a concern. You know, you expect these guys, you want to capacitate them with these equipment, but who's going to maintain it? And what's going to happen five years from now? How is it going to... And, and uh, right now, in, in my opinion, without the intervention and support from the government side or from the funding side, it's going to be very challenging. So in terms of the link between what the learning factory would do and how we would support that type of activity is we would teach on FOIA art technologies. That's one thing. But I mentioned that we use the FOIA art to help with the teaching. So the augmented reality wasn't necessarily a video. You can have like a hollow lens which guides you and asks you, have you done this? And then it shows you uh, step by step. I don't have that video on me now. But it, it, it literally shows you take the socket from here place it here and then lose it and then the person would do that so somebody with a very low skill set can start doing that type of work or learning to do that type of work they will still need to i mean if we look at something as important as brake pads you, you would want someone to be certified on that um so, so there needs to be some mechanism to 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 expedite that or to facilitate that but at least to expedite the learning where we have, firstly, in the township areas, a large number of people who leave school at a very early age. Um, they don't know necessarily what work opportunities are available. They don't necessarily have the skill set to go and get work. So it's looking at uplifting the youth specifically, but also upskilling the people who have been working for a number of years to certify them to ensure that you know, um, somebody's warranty is still maintained when they go to this type of uh, environment. So it may not necessarily be only in teaching somebody how to do the work. It may also be creating the network to verify digitally that this person is certified to do this type of work. So it's taking advantage of that. Uh, as I mentioned, it will be driven in partnership with these industry bodies. Uh, thanks, Shanil. You didn't attend the earlier session today, but we had Anthony from NBI uh, explaining several projects that they are involved with right. and, and I immediately thought that th this could very well facilitate the artisanal uh, skill sets without necessarily um, going to the level of certification. Hi, um, Yolanda from IPA. I just want to know, have you done, have you got any research available on the ages of the industry factories that you I mean uh, you know that to, to see which ones do actually have the new technologies because I'm aware of most factories still using all the old technologies and and that type of thing this is my first question and then um, I don't know if you know your uber app for matching skills there's an app called Yakazi which means for work um, and we actually just had a meeting with them this week to partner to make that available for South Africa. So they are sending a proposal because um, it will link to uh, all the East African countries are on it. And we're going to help expand it down to the Southern African countries through our partners. So there is already an app available like that. No, thank you for that. I'll, on the second part, I would definitely... I uh, like to follow up on that Yakazi app and see. Like I said, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. If it exists, by all means. Um, 
on the, the average age or the demographic that we would be targeting, it's going to be different for different industries. So for example, in mining, you have a certain demographic. On the shop floor for automotive, you have a different. And it's very um, dependent on the environment that, or the, the, the background or the, the area that this, this entity is servicing. So I don't have an answer for that specifically. Oh, the age of the factory, sorry, yes. No, no, absolutely, sorry. So, so I, I worked in a factory that had uh, manufactured sweets and they had machines from 1950. Um, there's, there's a lot of those. So there's a lot of brownfield projects. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to digital interventions, the company themselves need to understand that they have to have the strategy. It's not going to be pushed on by us. There must be a need from them, and they must have an identification of, um, to go and, and claim that we would understand their system better than them is ridiculous. They understand where to optimize. They understand where their bottlenecks are. They understand the challenges in the supply chain. So they would come to the learning factory to support them for these point solutions, possibly system solutions if they have the capex. Very seldom, you know, do we find that people would have or companies would have to they just want you to automate or address one issue. Um, so so the, in terms of the, the age, again, it depends on the environment because agriculture, how long, you know, is this entity existing for? It's different to the mines, different to the manufacturers. We will be looking at antiquated equipment as well. So part of it with the Internet of Things instrumenting old CNC equipment, that's actually what we do as well. Um, monitoring just to determine utilization, things like that. So we do train on that and we have equipment for that uh, and it accommodates basically you know brownfield and greenfield projects. More often than not we're going to encounter the brownfield and we're going to encounter companies who don't have the capex to invest in everything at once. So they have to do it step by step. So we would have to create a, a road map for them in that. And I mentioned that we have a 4R assessment that we do. So the first point of contact always is through that assessment to understand, you know, maybe it might be worthwhile to invest in a brand new uh, machine as opposed to instrumenting this, uh, but then that may have certain repercussions, etc. So it, it, th there's no set age that we're targeting. Uh, we have to look at, obviously, the needs of, of uh, and bear in mind, we haven't explored every single sector. We don't have all the answers for that. So from the entities that, and the companies that we did engage with, we were able to assist people who had machinery from the 1970s, and we were able to instrument them just even from a, you know, understanding the vibration characteristics of the machine, understanding things like the operators and their patterns, etc. We were able to, to do things like that. But uh, it, it's not really a, a set age that we would target now. Thanks, Anil. Um, I have a gentleman from Transnet. Okay, thank you. Um, firstly, I would thank you for a wonderful presentation that you had. I think my question was triggered by slide nine. Uh, I'm not sure if you can go there quickly. Basically, I had, um, I'll call it a rural area education in my early stages. So what used to happen, there was I'll say, yes. Uh, now I don't see that line. Use technology to support training. Focus on compensated development, learning in time. OK. But the, the line of thought is that what we used to do will be given assignment as a module. I'll call it a, a subject, art. Then we're taught to right. make a wooden spoon, uh, even we'll, we'll make a doormat from old plastics and grass, and then we we'll get marks for that. But in return, you could sell that and then earn a living. So that's what used to happen. It actually goes to the local economy store. So time passed, and then that was not there. I don't even think it's still there at, at schools. But now if we bring it to the concept of the times we are living in of, of IR, 
what interventions maybe that can be done through CSIR that in order to influence the Department of Education? Because I feel like uh, maybe we are still behind. You know, some of us, we only learned about coding and Excel when we were at Vasit. And I feel that, you know, you find that there are a lot of youngsters that are intelligent. Some maybe they are not good in, in, in just passing metric, but they have a skill and the thinking. And why are we not introducing these coding languages at, at early stages in rural areas, in, in before they even get to varsity? What level of influence can researches and the outputs like this have in the Department of Education in order to influence the curriculum because we are late, actually. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, so just on that note, one of the challenges that were raised um, by the Masita staff when we had them over to review our facility was that um, they told us it's nice to have all these technologies, but a lot of the issues stem from basic education. Yes. Now, that was never something that we initially, you know, even thought of uh, when we first initiated this project. We were focusing on TVET colleges. And then we find that the source of a lot of the challenges come from the feed or supply into the TVET college. And that's something that we have to systematically address. It's something we are engaging with uh, DHET and DSI on, but it's not something we fo uh, formalized as yet. What we believe is this type of concept where we have, and if I were to um, just paint the picture, if you can have a, an environment where you're teaching people to work on certain skills that allow them to create something that they can sell let's just say. But we look at 4IR side of things as well, in terms of creating an app or programming. Um, that possibly could support a lot of the challenges um, that we find. So, so personally, and uh, this is not something I, I can't claim to be an expert. I was a lecturer for 11 years, but I'm not a, an expert in education and technology in education. I'm sorry, of education. I'm an expert in technology in education. There's a difference. And, um, you know, I, I believe the concept and, and, and the nature, the very scalability of the design can be brought down to a school level. I mean, we all did tracks in physics. Right. I don't even know why I did ticker tapes, for example. It just came to my mind, right? But understanding then how to do these different, I mean, you learn something in IT, let's say, and then you go and you do it. So for me, the learning factory can support the doing part. And then you go and you learn by doing. And then you can have, I mean, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of hackathons that happen, a lot of initiatives that happen to support robotics in schools. I'm not going to mention which province, but I spoke to the MEC of a province who, who boasted that they invested 100 million rand in robotics in school. And I asked her why. Because did you link that to an industry pain point in your province? Unless you do that, what you're doing is you're creating a competency to export that person somewhere else. You're not helping them solve the problems locally or address that. So <clears throat> for me, there would need to be that collaboration across what, what are the issues here. So you know there's a saying, stick to what you're good at. And, and, and in certain environments, people have very um, intimate knowledge of the landscape they, they, they serve in. So for example, I can go in with as many advanced instruments as I want. Uh, Prof. Marwala, again from the UJ, he mentioned his, his grandmother was one of the best engineering optimization experts when it came to making clay pots, even though she didn't know engineering optimization. She knew which part of the river to get which clay from, how to go and create the shape of the pot, how to go and tap it to here. When, so that was engineering optimization, but she didn't have to do it from a mathematical perspective in terms of, of pen and paper. And what I'm saying is that there's that inherent knowledge of the landscape that exists in that environment. So can you build on those expertise? It doesn't mean you need to limit people to that type of setting. 
So somebody born in, a, born in a mining community doesn't need to work in mining. They can work anywhere they choose to. But I'm saying that uh, if you can relate it to something that they see every day, then that, that, that I think would uh, have an impact. And I think the learning factory concept can be scaled down there. But to answer your question, we haven't embarked on that as yet. There, there is something that we see a need for. But I mean, as soon as we open up to basic education, uh, it's, it's a, much bigger than, than we yeah, would anticipate. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. This is, my name is Debo Khodi. Call me Princess T. Princess I T. am from a company. We deal with renewable technologies and uh, we are working hand in hand with a, um, a foundation, Genesis BUC, um, doing everything um, in our power to make sure that our staff um, is trained from the from our foundation. Um, um, my role is a coach, and we are actually dealing. We have a program right now. It's called a program for a broken man. After all this um, was being happening, there's a lot of people that lost jobs. So what happened is um, the program. I've got a fitness. Uh, background so the entry level is uh, them getting um, um, stress and anxiety um, management programs and how do we do that we uproot um, the, the coaching uproots their potential like other simple things that they are able to do and um, as you talking I thought it's a good thing. I said, thanks God I came to in here because of, as you are speaking, our mandate matches um, what you are saying, but we didn't have the deeper know-how to fast track what we want to do. And we, we have a place that we busy um, working from. Um, any person with any, um, it's like we, we, we recycle any, any idea or any, anyone. Um, most people have got ideas or they're good at something and they never really went deep into it. So we created like a platform where if somebody is good at baking, if, if somebody's a plumber or whatever, our plan is to make sure that we've got um, the tools and all that in a certain level to for them to keep themselves busy and having um, um, services. When locals need services, they will just come to our, our foundation to get people from there where the tools are available. So because we start first with, uh, you know, when somebody's mindset is not okay. <laughs> they cannot perform properly. But my actual question is, how can our foundation collaborate, partner, you know, to sustain um, our beneficiaries, our foundation, our company, staff or management, you know, to, to all grow to, towards growing the economy, you know, supporting, using um, the, the 4IR. We've we, 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 we been looking for something like that. Yeah. And even though we didn't know, I the whole time I'm thinking, you know, I know what you want to do, but I wish there was some something that we could do at at a higher level. That that is because when you approach um, companies that fund or the government, um, normally they if they don't have that program, <laughs> they they don't even listen. It's like you're crazy. You understand, and we, we, we are in the communities, and I like what the gentleman was asking about the township economy on how you're going to do it, um, because it's been quite a while. We try to collaborate with the government, whether it's from the social development or um, they normally expect um, an organization to have one program, and we are not about events. We are about programs sustainable programs. 
So the question is, how can we collaborate? How can we partner? How can we put ourselves in a professional level where uh, it makes sense to us and we know that it can work? But when, when people don't take time to understand where you're going and they don't even give you a chance, um, we will get there, but it could take longer. And I love this. We need a lot of, uh, I need a lot of coaching so that we can maneuver, so that it benefits us. Thank you. Thanks. So yeah, I don't want to be a cowboy and just jump into solutions there. <laughs> uh, we, we would need to engage more formally on that. But uh, I mean, as a starting point, I would ask, you know, for a TVET college, um, for me, the metric that I would use to measure performance is not how many students they graduate, but how many students get absorbed yes. into industry. Similarly, then, in your case, uh, based on what you're telling me now, it seems it's a lot of, you know, a focus on, on well-being of a person, getting them stabilized first, and then getting them productive to support someone. How would we measure that? And how would we measure the well-being of somebody? That's the one question I would ask. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just random example, but uh, one of the examples that came to mind when you were speaking was a uh, company that, that tracks fleets of vehicles. Recently, with one of the local universities, uh, invested in a wearable for their drivers, the truck drivers. And um, what it would do is it would measure their oxygen levels, their heart rates, their pressure, etc. And they used AI to predict the fatigue level of the driver. So the watch then could, um, uh, you know, and they got it accredited, I don't think by all medical bodies, that's still in process if I'm not mistaken, but it's an example of how uh, some technology can help you with your well-being. Um, you know, the smartwatch, for example, tells you when you're sitting down for too long, things like that. Uh, tells you your patterns, tells you to change this and that. So it's difficult to answer in terms of specific interventions, but I do know that there are technologies out there to monitor uh, somebody's physical state, uh, and then it can alert, you know, and uh, more importantly for me, when you want to optimize a system, you need to track the inputs. And, you know, how many times did this person's blood pressure elevate? Is there a reduction in that since they came to your institute? Then we look at, I mean, that's the stabilization side. Then making them productive, I mean, the, the very nature of what we're doing in terms of customizing the training system, uh, using these technologies to, so you've got somebody who bakes, right? But no two people are necessarily going to bake the same. So no two people are going to necessarily bake the same. You, you know, the, the cupcakes would taste different. Yeah. Well, for, for me, anyway. Um, that's between my wife and mom. Just <laughs> um, so, so it, with aspects like that, can we use technology to sort of standardize and, and, and monitor and expedite or sort of, you've got this person now who's experienced, who bakes the best cupcakes. Can we take her knowledge and impart it through technology to someone? And it doesn't have to be physically there, it can even be remotely. So remotely teach them how to do this work. Uh, so there's, there's interventions, and again, I'm, I'm talking at the risk of sort of coming up with solutions, that's not my intention. But I see possible avenues for exploring further, and we would have to engage on that further. But we would be open to doing something like that. Well done, thanks, uh, Sunil. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. That brings us to the end of the session. Uh, thank you for staying up so late. <laughs> Uh, and it also concludes the NCPC conference. Um, please feel free to network amongst one another and with the speakers as well. Uh, thank you once again for being here. Uh, travel safe and have a good rest of the week. Presentations available will we receive them via email or should how does it work? Yeah, everybody that registered will be notified how to access the all the presentations from all the uh, tracks.
So not only those that you happen to attend, uh, but you will have access to all the presentations that uh, were uh, given during this week. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.